welcome back everybody. We are so glad you're joining us again in this fifth in a series of podcasts focusing on high leverage world language performance assessments produced by the National Foreign Language Resource Center at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. In this series, we are focusing on performance assessment in world languages. And throughout these episodes, we are working up to integrated performance assessments, which will be discussed in the final two episodes of the podcast. In our last episode, Ying Jin shared strategies for designing and administering interpersonal tasks in distance learning. In today's episode, we will be exploring assessments in the interpretive mode. And I am so pleased to welcome today's special guest, Dr. Margaret Malone, or Meg. Meg is the Director of the Assessment and Evaluation Language Resource Center and a research professor at Georgetown University. She is also the Director of the Center for Assessment, Research, and Development at ACTFL. She has more than two decades of experience in language test development and teacher training through both online and face-to-face -face methods, data collection and survey research, and program evaluation. Thank you so much for joining us, Meg. Thank you so much for having me. It's so nice to see you. I'm excited to see you too, and I'm really looking forward to our interview. Oh, me too. So here we go, let's get started. As we get ready to dig deeply into this topic, it may be helpful to start by reviewing the key characteristics of the interpretive mode. What should educators keep in mind about this mode? I think the most important thing to remember is that interpretive tasks are one way. That means you read a text, however long or short, or listen to a passage, but there's no interaction. You can't ask questions of the writer or speaker, you can't work together to construct meaning. Um, when I think of the most quintessential interpretive listening task is something like listening to a podcast. You're listening, but you can't ask questions. Although in the interest of full disclosure, I sometimes talk back to the podcast, but I'm always relieved when it doesn't answer me. Um, and so you're listening and the whole episode flows. But let's look more deeply at something like a podcast. There are some formulaic parts of a podcast like introductions, acknowledgements, other background, and sometimes there are commercials in addition to the content focus of a podcast. For reading, I think of reading a newspaper, whether it's online or, um, or in paper copy, as a great example of an interpretive reading task. Um, you know, sometimes I throw down the newspaper because I'm frustrated or annoyed, but it doesn't respond. It can't help me construct meaning. And I think the difficult part for the instructor is also that you can't watch the learner listen or read and be certain that they've understood without asking them to do something else, like answer a question or highlight a part of the text or respond in some way. So I think that's one of the challenging parts about the interpretive mode. Yeah, you bring up a really good point that we really have to have the learner interact with those texts in some way that we can collect and look at and give feedback on later. Um, in addition to the, the part that a lot of language teachers remember that it is a one-way communication tool, but also those tasks, listening and reading, what we interpret from those things, that happens in our head, right? It's invisible. Um, so we really have to work at designing opportunities for to make all of that visible, both to our learners as well as to us. Exactly, exactly. Um, what are the characteristics of a well-designed interpretive task? And I'd like to actually break this out to show kind of how they might be similar and or different as you go across the ranges of proficiency. So the characteristics of a well-designed task for novice as well as for intermediate and for those of our learners who do get there through extensive study and so on, advanced language learners. So I think first I'm going to talk about the characteristics of well-designed interpretive tasks, and then I'm going to break it down by level. Is that okay with you, Nicole? Absolutely. Great. So with any level of task, the first and foremost thing to keep in mind is that the task needs to have one clear function. What are you asking the reader or listener to do? Are they reading or listening for the gist or for a specific detail? So you need to think about what's the function. And then the second thing you wanna think about is, is the reading text or the listening passage 
aligned to the same level as the function. So we don't want to give a novice level task to um, an advanced level uh, listening text or vice versa. So think about the actual level with which your text or passage is aligned and then develop the task to go along. The third thing in general you need to really think about is to make sure your directions are super clear and that the student knows what they need to do to show that they have understood. Make sure that the task they're being asked to complete is aligned to the function. Are you reading for the gist? So ask for a response to address this. So that's some general ideas for um, looking at how to develop uh, interpretive tasks. And now I'm going to talk about specific levels. Um, at the novice level, you want really short texts or passages that are really clear and unambiguous. It should be a very short response. And at the novice level, I'm gonna talk about this a little more later, I think, these may or may not be authentic. At the intermediate level, you want to think about simple sentences, sentence length speech. Remember that most passages or texts at this level should be short, simple, and contain redundancies. Now, at the advanced level, these can be longer, and you can be asking learners to look at main ideas and supporting details. But remember that the advanced level is very concrete and solid. So, Actually, that brings up another question that um, as I'm thinking and listening to what you're saying about both the design of tasks in general, as well as tasks for particular ranges of proficiency, um, what advice would you give regarding the selection of the language in which the students respond? When is it most appropriate for them to respond in English or their home language versus responding in the target language and why would we be making that dis distinction or consideration? So that is a great point and if you look at Lee 1986 um, which is one of the quintessential studies on um, reading in other languages um, what Lee suggests is that you put the passage in the target language and you respond to questions in your first language. I think you need to figure out what will best show you what your learners know. I have seen um, instructors who are able to have a text in the target language and then have um, the questions or the response that they're looking for also in the target language. But this involves a lot of work on both parts. The learner has to understand what they're going to do. Um, the hardest thing about assessment is, is it that the learner doesn't know or can't respond or that they don't know what they're supposed to do? Um, and I think it really, I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say, it depends on the stakes of the assessment, right? Um, if you're doing you know, a formative assessment in your classroom, of course you're gonna wanna stay in the target language. If you're doing something really high stakes, you wanna make sure that you're really understanding what the learner understood. So what I would like to say is look at the pros and cons. Do your students or learners know um, what they're being asked to do and can they show it to you? Mm -hmm. You know, do they have the ability, if you're going to have them respond in the target language, as a teacher, as an educator, are you evaluating their comprehension of the text and their interpretation of the text? Or are you evaluating their ability to communicate in a written mode in you know, the target language and how, you know, separating those two things has sometimes been hard for teachers. Um, so really choosing, like you said, choosing the appropriate task that gives you the information you need without perhaps accidentally complicating it with things that, that you don't need or that make it hard for you to distinguish what it is that your learner's response is actually telling you um, in terms of what they understood and what they can do. So can I tell you a little story about that? Yeah. Yeah. So the first time I took Spanish when I was a, uh, a first year in high school, um, I had this amazing teacher who's still teaching. At the time, her name was Diane Colosi, and she taught us directions. Um, so that by the end of the year, when we took a test, all the directions were in the target language. And this was, um, <clears throat> this is a, let's call it the beginning of the proficiency movement. Um, but what it really taught me all along was that it's not so much it's not so much that learners have limitations it's what we can help them to do with the language and 
Senorita Colosi, as I remember, decided that she was going to teach us all these directions. So she had very, you know, simple things. And I remember the first time we got the test with all the directions in the target language, I was so excited. Um, and of course, remember, I have a PhD in linguistics, so you would expect that. But she didn't just throw us in the first test and say, good luck, kids. She brought us up to that point. Right. And that's really critical to that support that we provide along the way so that learners can um, really become people who navigate the target language as a natural approach to how they're going to be in our classes and engage in the work that we're going to do. We and so if you, if you raised your hand, she would come around, she'd point to the word you needed. Yes. And you'd say, oh, es que be it. Oh, of course I'm supposed to write. Yes. Yes. So that you're still supported to you keep using the target language to understand through whatever means, whether it's gestures, examples, synonyms, you know, whatever we can pull out to do it. Exactly. Exactly. Um, how can teachers provide learners with opportunities to recognize cultural perspectives in authentic texts during interpretive tasks? Oh my gosh, I think interpretive tasks are amazing for cultural perspective. And one of the nice things about them is that you can really mine them for more details, especially after a first look. So if you're using authentic listening snippets or short pieces, you could first ask learners what they notice. Um, some might immediately notice cultural perspectives and others might just be struggling with the content and might need to have it pointed out. Um, one of the things I, I often say is that we move really quickly, both in general in the world and often in language learning specifically. It's really wonderful to read a text once and respond to the assessment task and then go back and look at the culture, unless of course the culture is the focus of the assessment task. And it's also great to make the cultural perspective the focus of the task. You can do either or both. But one thing I want to stress, especially for learners who are just starting, is just do one thing at a time. You know, make sure that you're just asking them to do one thing at a time. At the higher levels, of course, they can attend to culture and language. But very often at the novice level, we say things like, did you see all the things going on there? And they're thinking, I recognized four words. Okay, I need a little rest. <laughs> Yeah, you're absolutely right. In fact, I want to kind of draw everybody back to what you said when you said that um, they can mine a text for more details, especially after the first look through the text, meaning that we are going to intentionally have students dive back into authentic texts multiple times, but for a different purpose each time. So that each time they do it, they're actually building on and deepening their, their knowledge of the text and what it says and how they're interpreting it. And this isn't just for reading texts. This is also for listening yes. texts. I'm a big fan of podcasts back, you know, when I commuted. And um, if I heard a really good podcast, um, I would listen to it. And then sometimes I would rewind it and listen to it again because I got the plot, but I wanted to go back and get the nuance, right? Um, and I think this is really important. We want to make sure that we're not just skating over the surface, but that we're really digging in. Absolutely. Thank you. What are some different kinds of tasks that learners can do in order to demonstrate their comprehension and interpretation of texts? Oh my gosh, it's almost endless. Um, so I'm going to start with reading on a screen because I think that's something that um, a lot of us from <clears throat> certain generations are used to paper. So you can highlight the answer to the question on your screen and the instructor can go around, whether it's virtually or in person and see, did they get the right part of the text highlighted? Um, you can respond to a specific question. Um, you can highlight the main idea. I love having students do that, especially um, now that we're beyond the point of using, you know, highlighters on paper, you can highlight it on the screen and the book isn't damaged for life, right? Um, one of the things I love to do for a task for listening is following the steps in the process, because as the listener, you can go back and think, when did I get tired? When did the task start really uh, getting to be too much for me? What do I need to do to attend to it in the future? Um, I also, I, I think we need more art in our lives, and I just want you all to know I'm the worst artist in the world, and yet I sometimes listen to things and I draw pictures to try to visualize it and to map it out. Um, you can circle the right response from a selection of pictures. You can act things out. Um, at the higher levels, you can talk about or write about what you've uh, read or listened to. You should 
but I'm just gonna come back to this. You always need to think about what the level of the passage or text is, and then what the purpose of the, ta the task is, and how you're going to align those in terms of asking students or learners to do something. Yeah, you're absolutely right. In fact, you one of the things you drew out was a number of ways for students to interact with the text and show themselves and you different aspects of what they're attending to and noticing and understanding. Um, and then the other piece, as far as really thinking about the task and its range of proficiency where it sits, um, as well as the text, because I think sometimes as educators, we don't catch it fast enough that, you know, we might have had a rubric, for example, for how students were going to respond to a question. Now, this would be, again, if we're having them respond in the target language. And if we set up a task in which it would be perfectly logical for them to respond with a one word answer, and they're functioning in the intermediate range, and then we ding them right on the response for not having provided an intermediate response when the task itself was set up to not need it you know that no native speaker would have necessarily bothered to respond in a complete sentence for example with that same task um, that's something we have to own and really be thoughtful about as educators with that alignment to the task and the targeted proficiency range that we're trying to both support and push our learners towards where they are and now Nicole, you've brought up an amazing point as always, which is um, we need to be, we need to think about what kind of a response we ask and ask that kind of a question. Do we want an open-ended question? Do we want a single word question? How many times do you ask somebody, how is your day? Fine, right? Um, so what do we need to do with that? We need to have follow-up questions. Absolutely. And then one of the other kinds of tasks I know that I really like to have at some point, and I actually begin it with novice, um, but I do often continue to ask it. Now I taught high school and the vast majority of my learners exited more at intermediate mid um, mm -hmm. being in a school where they couldn't start until they were freshmen. Uh, but as uh, guessing meaning from context, it's one of those skills that our learners for whatever reason come into language courses feeling like they're supposed to somehow know all the words and all the answers and they're used to this from other classes where they they've learned that they could memorize enough to know all the answers right and so then they're kind of taken aback in a language class where we're constantly having them be confronted with texts that include words they've never seen before and words that we actually don't need them to know at this point in time we're fine with them not knowing them but they will never know all the words ever. We don't know all the words in our native language. So the other kind of task in addition to, and there's a number of ways to do it, but in addition to all the amazing tasks that you had, which I also really love, I'm a huge fan of highlighting and pictures and right circling and kinesthetically putting things in order and so on, um, is making sure that in almost every text I'm giving my learners, especially at the novice and lower intermediate ranges, frequent opportunities to be kind of forced to guess meaning from context of words that I know they shouldn't necessarily have seen before. Um, well, and not just words you haven't seen before, but if you're, um, I'm probably the last person in the world who also listens to the radio on the way to work. It's fast. You don't get all the words, right? And in a podcast, for example, no. um, I'm a big fan of modern love myself. Yeah. They use a lot of big words. And um, sometimes I'm driving along and somebody honks and I miss a word. Yeah. Does that mean I need to rewind the whole thing and go right. back? No, I mean, I'm no. driving, that would be very unsafe. But you also need to think about what are the strategies you use to understand? And um, to know when you don't need to understand. Or, when it's okay or, to let it go. Right. And I think, um, I also think so many of our language students are so anxious about the wrong things. They don't need to understand everything. No. They just need to understand generally. Right. When I, uh, the infamous Miss Colosi and one of my great Spanish professors in college, Joy Rangelian Berge, used to encourage us to just, they'd say, don't stop and look things up. Just read, just listen, and then go back. And, um, and actually, to be honest, it helped me in my English literature courses, in my other classes. Um, it's a great skill to have, to have this tolerance for ambiguity. Yes, there are so many ways that world language classes actually support our students' literacy across the board. I mean, we are the class that specializes in taking what was completely incomprehensible and making it comprehensible and giving learners words and the power of words and phrases that they can own and use, right, contextually. It's just such a huge part of what we do in addition to the intercultural understanding. 
Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about some connections that exist because the modes don't always operate completely independently of each other when we talk about the modes of communication. So what are some ways that you might say that learners could use authentic texts as supports when doing performance assessment tasks in either the interpersonal or presentational modes? I think authentic texts are great jumping off points for all modes. Um, Although, as a caveat, I think some teachers feel uncomfortable using completely authentic texts at the novice level. And some texts do need to be simplified. But I just want you to think about some of the great interactions that you have with people, some real life interactions. You go to a movie or you read the news. How many times do you put the newspaper down when you're talking to your husband? You say, you've got to hear this, right? Um, now, what you want to do is finish and then you want to talk about it. I read this great thing today. I was sitting outside with some friends right before um, keeping a good distance. Um, I came out here and we were talking about the news. We were talking about things that we'd heard. Um, we read and listen, not just to answer, you know, multiple choice questions or to circle things. We do it to communicate, to talk about what we've learned and to hear other people's points of view, authentic texts and Listening passages are a great way of doing that. You don't know how many times I come home from, from work and I walk in and say, you won't believe what I heard on my way home. And that leads to more conversation. I also wanna talk about using these for writing because I think it's really easy to think you listen or read something and then you talk about it. You can also write about it. Um, and what you wanna do in assessment as the instructor is think about how much are you assessing what they understood and how much are you assessing the writing they come up with, right? to make sure that you give them credit for what they understood and also understand that um, even in our first languages, sometimes <clears throat> we are not good listeners or readers and we pick one thing and we go off on that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I really like, for example, especially trying to take, tie it to what would be an authentic writing prompt um, for their age and experience. And again, I taught high school. Um, so sometimes, having it set up to where they're going to comment, you know, for example, on, you know, this, this particular blog or this podcast episode just, you know, just launched and there's a comment feed. So, you know, you're going to now write like your responses and the, and the questions that this, you know, generated for you as you read or as you listened, and you're going to put, you know, in, in order to theoretically post that, even if we're not necessarily going to really post it in order to protect their identities, but just so that they have this, it's an authentic reason why it's like, oh yeah, I might read something and actually respond to it in some kind of online forum or in another way um, so that we can use it as a jumping off point, just like the and, conversations. And can I just talk a little bit about the littles, mm -hmm. um, not the high yes. school, but the littler kids. That's awesome. Um, I remember, you know, once doing some interviews with some younger kids about um, something and it was about a summer program actually. And I said to them, what was the best part about the summer program? And all they heard was summer and they're like, I got a puppy. And, um, and luckily I spent a lot of time with young children. I was like, great, what's your puppy like? Tell me right. about your puppy. <laughs> and then I came back and said, okay, the summer program you were in. Uh huh you did these things. So I often think too that we, we, mistake, um, we mistake students' enthusiasm for lack of understanding and we right, often right. need to redirect them multiple times. That's actually not what I meant. I mean, we do that all the time in our regular life, right? No, I didn't ask you what you wanted me to get at the grocery store. I asked you what you wanted me to get at the pharmacy. Right. You weren't listening, but we should be nicer to our kids perhaps than the people yes. we live with. <laughs> Yes, that's a really great example. Um, and, and thinking about for those, those who have that really amazing opportunity to teach language to our youngest students, um, do you actually have any, any highlights or thoughts you would share about interpretive texts and things for our youngest learners? Um, one thing, I, I think it's great to give our youngest learners authentic examples of things that kids their age see, but less of it. They don't need to watch a whole 30 minute episode. They can watch a little bit of it. That's they correct. can look at the language equivalent of the kids page. Um, I still read the kids page in the newspaper. Yes. It's kind of at my intellectual level a lot of the time. Um, but I think kids are really um, 
I think what you need to do is, is meet them where they are and make sure that you're asking them the right question and redirecting them. It's completely developmentally appropriate for a child to not understand your question and to renegotiate it. And, um, and the other thing about in, interpretive tasks, um, you need to think about the proficiency level and the developmental level, and these need to be aligned. Yes, thank you, absolutely. What kinds of feedback is most helpful to learners as they complete interpretive tasks with authentic texts? In general, structured, precise feedback on what they were supposed to do or understand. So the first thing to do is to give them really precise feedback. And the other is to say, tell me what happened. Um, with reading, sometimes I ask learners to look back at the text and figure out what went right or wrong. Where was the point where you lost the thread? Um, in listening, I think one of the great pieces of feedback we can give our students is to help them focus, be quiet, and really listen. Um, I think so often we don't just listen, and it's a skill that we need. Um, if you think about any time you spent in a, in a country or a culture where you don't speak the language, think of how attentive you are. You're never, you go home and you're just like, oh, I need to stop paying attention, right? And we need to help remind our students that when you're not as proficient, you need to really pay attention. You need to be listening, you need to be reading, you need to really be on your game. And I think this is really helpful feedback we can give to students. When did you notice that you started to drift? What are some things you can do to help yourself focus again? And what are some of the, the tools or like the structural supports built into the text, whichever, whether it's an auditory one or a printed one, you know, that you can leverage to help you keep the thread? You know, were there places where you missed that there was, you know, either um, some some repetition, a visual cue in, audit, in oral text that include video, um, if there's headings, pictures, you know, like what can we do to help us kind of stay on track, even if we're not understanding everything? Um, so in a reading text, of course, any sort of structure around it that background, I, I'm thinking of a journal article here, you know, background, literature review, method, um, but this holds true for, um, for literature and nonfiction that isn't a journal article as well. Um, the other thing I ask students to look and listen for are, are uh, transition words. Um, yes. Good a point. transition word means something is changing or something's going on. And that's a good time to stop and think, was I ready for this transition? Do I need to focus on this transition? Did I understand what came before? And this is where assessment versus testing comes in. A great, a great assessment is to say to students, okay, let's listen to this. Okay, let's go back. What happened? When, when did you start losing attention? What are some things you can do to pay attention better? Um, what are some words you could have listened or looked for? What did Definitely you notice? Know, like which way that this text was headed? You know? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, and of course, when you're an emerging reader or listener, you don't always, you're not always reading high level uh, tasks that, um, that you get the, the clues on, right? Um, so you expect it, the intermediate level to be reading very simple intermediate tasks that are, you know, are straightforward. It's really at the really high levels that you start getting into, you know, mystery novels and things like that. Right, which is hard sometimes for our learners, again, because especially, um, especially our learners as they are older, they feel some frustration with the fact that they're not understanding and interpreting the target language texts with the same level of comfort that they do in, let's say, English. And there's this disconnect in them where they're experiencing this cognitive dissonance of not being able to understand or produce language that matches what their thoughts are. Um, and that's just, you know, something we have to help our learners grasp, grapple with a little bit and be okay with, you know, some, because there's this fear of failure and fear of not understanding. And it's compounded sometimes for learners who, who find stress in this when they feel like the only things they can understand seem to be um, chronologically so much younger, right, than they are. Um, 
Well, you know, the other night I was trying to figure out how to put something up on our language management system. So I watched no fewer than seven YouTube videos to figure out how to do it. None of them mentioned the box I was supposed to uncheck. But, but that's quite authentic. Um, yeah. and, and YouTube is a great source for listening. Um, one oh, yeah. of the nice things about YouTube is you can find authentic, appropriate yes. um, it, passages that are kids their age talking about things. Yes. And then you can turn yep. around and say, they were talking about this, you know, star in a telenovela. Why don't you read about this person in whatever the equivalent of People magazine is? Right. I love that. And that way you can just keep that learning going and providing them with additional authentic text which, so that they branch off on a different aspect of a topic or go deeper into a topic. Um, I also really find that the, um, you know, the, the authentic texts and the use of these texts really purposefully and strategically is really supports our students' literacy skills. Um, if teachers choose to design learning experiences so that it accomplishes that task, so that learners are constantly having to really really investigate their own understanding of the text and making predictions, but then going back and checking those predictions or making sure we capture the questions that arise as they listen and as they read, because those are strategies, making predictions and questioning and, and uh, making connections to other things they've read or heard or experienced or learned elsewhere are the things that good readers and, and really proficient listeners do naturally, but they do it in their heads. So it's not visible to everyone else. So it's, I really like it when we can pull those things out and make those part of the tasks as well. Um, you know, with nearly all schools, probably commencing in the fall with some kind of distance or blended learning. Which strategies do you recommend for leveraging technology for interpretive performance assessment tasks? So on the one hand, we talk about distance learning as ideal for the interpretive mode. Um, on the other hand, I think we need to think about using um, distance or blended learning to incorporate more interpretive tasks also into any face-to-face -face sessions. Um, one of the nice things about some virtual learning environments is that learners can send you questions via chat functions privately, and you can also use nonverbal cues for students to ask you to slow down um, what you're doing, slow down the listening activity, or, oh my God, prof, I don't, I don't know what's going on here in this text. Um, I think very, I, I've been to some really amazing classes where I've seen in class listening and reading activities going on. They don't take up the whole class and they tend to be part of, you know, integrated assessment, but they also allow the instructor to see in real time what's happening. Um, what are the students, at what point, you know, at what point does this start during the listening? At what point are they getting frustrated with the text? So I think that there's a lot you can do in distance learning. And the nice thing is the students are so busy attending to what they're doing, they don't have time to look across your Zoom or Teams or whatever to see what everybody else is doing. And they can send you questions. You know, they might send you a question, what's this word? And this gets back to our point. Do you need to know the meaning of that word? Right? Um, and I, so I, I think that there's a real opportunity and I think we underplay the opportunity for interpretive tasks, not just as, you know, asynchronous activities, but as synchronous activities in learning. Um, the other thing um, you can do, I think, in an online activity is you can ask them to read or listen and then show their understanding through really short activities, more than when you're in a physical classroom. Um, you know, a physical classroom, um, I've taught a lot of ages and um, getting students into groups or pairs in a physical classroom can be really disruptive. In Zoom, you can go and then you can liter quite literally zoom between them to see what's happening. You can make it a minute and a half and then bring them back. Whereas in class, sometimes I think we go on too long because we're looking around like, oh, those two haven't finished, these two, whatever. But in a Zoom, you can say, you have a minute and a half, get it done. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention um, about this is that um, 
not to just put all of it in asynchronous, unless you're of course completely asynchronous and then you definitely should put everything in this asynchronous, but also to give your learners an opportunity to try these things out, you know, listening and reading activities um, together and with you. You know, that before I hit on something else you said, that actually brings up something that I've been reading a lot more about recently, which is this concept of like co-use of technology. And there was already a potential prior even to the pandemic and everything, there was already starting, we were starting to see more signs of students kind of working with technology and with their curriculum in isolation, especially as more and more um, publishers of curriculum, especially in the core content areas have gone exclusively online. So they're just kind of in isolation working with, through the content. Um, and so what you bring up is this really important point that we're seeing a big need for, which is ensuring that there's actually co-use of technology, people working together and navigating a task through technology together collaboratively um, at the time. And when you talked about, I loved what you said about not limiting the texts to synchronous, I mean, sorry, to asynchronous opportunities. And interestingly, and the only other thing I would add is when they are done in asynchronous times, one of the things that is helpful, and it kind of goes back to what you were saying a little bit about some of the struggles we run into when we have them in our classes with us, is that students have the gift of time. If they need to listen to the text again, they can. Um, whereas sometimes when we're in our classrooms, like, well, you're going to get two listens through the, for this practice, and then we're moving on, right? If, if, so if a student needs to, in an asynchronous setting, or even if you did it synchronously before, but you can still post those resources into whatever learning system or platform you're using so that they can actually access those resources in an ongoing way and keep diving back into them and so on. So that's an, an you brought up a lot of really nice features of what, you know, the silver lining of what's happening now as we all look at distance learning and blended learning. The only thing I would, I would remind people of is that, um, there are time limits in yes. real life and that we want to make sure that we are saying to students, this is how many times I expect you to listen to this. Mm -hmm. One of my biggest um, worries about um, online learning is that students, uh, as they leave the spontaneous mode and they go right into presentational. Everything has to be perfect. I need to know everything. You don't want so that. I like to tell my, I often uh -uh. At, at work and with my students, I often say, this is how long I think this should take you. Yes. I don't really. want this to be perfect. I want you to see how long you can do it, how, what you can get done in this time. Mm -hmm. So that's your first task. Your test, second task may, might be to repeat it, but to think of it in terms of um, what can you do the first time? Mm -hmm. You know, when you listen to something over and over and you've rated AP tests and so on, right, Nicole? Yeah. You know, the third time you listen to it, you think, my gosh, that was like four words and it was all the same word. And the first time it sounded great. Yeah. <laughs> so you want to make sure that you're not changing the construct by over listening or over reading. Mm -hmm. So I would say you can do things multiple times, but be clear with your student. These are the conditions under which you should do it. Yes. And be clear with them also that, you know, if you find yourself still working on this same thing for whatever, X amount of time, you need to actually stop and public and reach out to me for some support because there are also students, right, who will just, you know, all of a sudden spend two hours on like one text trying to get every, you know what I mean? And giving them not just the amount of time, but also if you choose to go over, it's really important that if, once you hit this point, I really need you to stop the task and reach out if you're still struggling with it. Because language, the purpose of learning a language is to have it develop and not to have it be perfect. You know, right. remember the, you know, when your second or third year students start spitting out creative new sentences and they make no sense to anybody but you, but that's the yes. moment. Yes. That's what you want. You want, you're an imperfect learner and that is exactly where you need to be right that's now. Where you need to be. And I loved it. I, I would tell my students, I am that one person. I'm like, if, if you were a toddler, I would be your parent. I am the one person in the world who can consistently understand you no matter how you garble your message. And I am also the one person in the world you can consistently understand. So like we'd have a guest speaker and I would literally repeat word for word what the guest speaker said, right? And they're like, oh, exactly. I get it now. <laughs> 
<laughs> because they are completely, you know, accustomed and comfortable. And obviously we want to get them past that, but we want that beginning developmental stage where they can throw together a couple of words that actually don't go together and still be understood by someone like us who's sympathetic and, and sees where that came from. The other thing I like to ask students is, did you explain what you wanted to explain or did you explain something that the other person understood and it wasn't what you meant? Really good point. Yeah. <laughs> We're going back to that whole important thing about negotiation of meaning exactly. and clarifying exactly. and, you know, clarifying you, that your own intentions were correctly communicated. <laughs> did you accidentally explain to your teacher that you understood the passage and you really had no idea? <laughs> yeah. Um, are there any particular challenges or pitfalls for teachers to look out for as they design and implement their interpretive tasks, especially in the face of distance learning, but even outside of that, just like particular things that you caution teachers about as they design those tasks and implement them? I really believe less is more. Um, I think we often give students too much to do and they get overwhelmed and frustrated, especially in the interpretive mode, because as you said, it's in their head. So when you produce um, a piece of writing or a text, it's done. But when you're reading, it's, you know, it's just there. Nobody can see it. Um, so I would say the first thing to think about is less is more, especially at the lower levels, because um, as somebody once brilliantly pointed out at a conference, you don't get to be an advanced level unless you go through novice and intermediate, which is quite <laughs> obvious, but it's something I think we need to remind ourselves. And our students. <laughs> and our students. Um, the other is to really ask your students for feedback. You know, how is this going? Is this too much? Um, when I teach um, undergraduate and graduate classes um, in linguistics, I do weekly surveys of my students. Um, because I'm, you know, a glutton for punishment. But in all seriousness, I love these surveys. Um, and you can do these in the target language. You can have stickers. You can have thumbs up, thumbs down. You can do a time, too much, too little. Um, and I think this really, it, it doesn't just help students learn. It builds trust. Because then they can go back to you and they can say, uh, I'm sorry, you know, that was too much. And, and, and then point. you respect that. Um, the other thing um, I like to remind uh, people of is that cultural learning is not all at once. Cultural learning should be just like anything else. It's little bits. It's things that you pick up on. I remember the first time I went overseas with my kids. I asked them what they noticed and they said, people aren't looking on their phones all, their all the time while they're walking down the street. And I thought, what an excellent message. Yeah, an observation. <laughs> right. And um, and I also think sometimes we think that that cultural message is going to hit that student on the, you know, on the forehead. They need some time to get it sometimes. So I would say slow down, do less well, and communicate with your students. Absolutely. And really, as you were talking about building trust, like through surveys, that trust is built by them, by your learners seeing that you actually take that feedback and adapt or use it in some way going forward so that as you said they can come back to you later knowing that you really do respect their voice and their feedback so the first step is giving those surveys and then i would submit that a follow-up step is when necessary when you review it and see something that is necessary that you do thank them for their feedback and let them know any changes or whatever it is that you're going to do going forward and and for people who think you need a complicated Qualtrics survey. No. With distance learning, no. you can have everybody give a thumbs up. And if you're yeah. feeling embarrassed, there are ways that you can keep them from seeing what each other are saying, right? And that's building trust for you too. Um, you know, did you like this? Do you want more of this? Do you want less of it? And to say to your students, we're not going to read about giraffes every week. Not everybody likes giraffes. Sometimes you have to read about chocolate. I could read about chocolate every week. But again, um, helping your students understand that, um, that they're learning to read and listen so that they can do it in areas that they like to listen and read about. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great way to wrap, wrap this up. You know, I think, um, Meg, I just want to thank you so much for coming to this podcast and really sharing all of these wonderful insights, this expertise, 
I think that our listeners and viewers are going to so appreciate everything that you shared about the interpretive mode and the examples. It's all going to be very meaningful to them. And um, in our next episode, which will be episode six of our podcast, we will actually begin our examination of integrated performance assessments with Dr. Francis Troyan. So I hope everybody will join us then. And again, I thank you so much, Meg. And thanks everyone for watching. Thanks everyone.